G'day guys, welcome back to Steelers Nation Australia. I have a very, very, very special guest, my mate Merrill Hodge. What's going on, mate? How are you? I like mate. I like the mate part, brother. Everything's good, man. They're early, was... but we're rocking and rolling, brothers. Yeah, because right now it is my 10 p.m. I'm from the future. Uh, very early days. So I do say thank you for coming on the show on, on Steelers Nation Australia. Uh, have you been to Australia before? Just a quick question. Have you been to Australia? No, actually, my, my agent is there right now, and um, he, we're working on a contract. And every time he talks to me, he's he's going down some boat. Um, he's running to some a, a kangaroo or, or or a gator somewhere. Is he, I can't is he in the outback? The reception is so bad, I can't understand him. But I've actually always wanted to go to Australia. It's actually one of my uh, bucket list, list places. It's probably the only place I really want to want to go. I've been to a lot of places, but I've never been there. Yeah. When, when we get to the to the end, the end of the podcast here, I've got a really uh, special question I want to ask you about, like Australian, uh, and also retains to Debo Harrison as well. I actually asked Ike Taylor this question too. Um, but I do want to say thank you for coming on the show. It is fantastic that you're here. I know you're a very busy man. You've worked in uh, ESPN, Steelers running back. You know, you, you've worked uh, Steelers media side. Now you're also doing like Steelers scouting, right? You're, you're, you're the yeah. scout like, yeah. like technically I, uh... right now, right? Yeah, we work with uh, the scouting department and the pro personnel evaluation department, team evaluation. So do a little bit of everything to, to help them and work with them. And, and I learn in the process. Yeah. I just want to say, how do you fit all this stuff in? How do you how do you organize with all these things going on? You are a very, very busy man. How do, how do you do it all? Well, I really structure my day. Um and I get I lot so many I I lot certain time to certain things. So like the most important thing in my life, um, and this is not a selfish thing, is me. Um, yeah. So I have to take care of myself, but I give myself an hour, an hour and a half, and I do that first thing in the morning. So once I've done that, now I can service all the other responsibilities uh, that I have, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a better servant for other people when I yeah. do that. You know, then I get into things that I, I need to get done for the Steelers. I, I prepare for things that I need to do for my speaking perspective and my family perspective. So um, that that takes up the day. And is that like a, a a good thing for yourself to keep very busy, you know, all the time? Well, personally, I, did, I like it that way. I like to do a variety of things. There's not, I don't like to get locked into just one thing. I've never been like that, you know, like when I was a kid. I mean, I, I like playing all kinds of sports, mm -hmm. you know, um, I was actually probably a better baseball player originally, initially, and then I became, then basketball became a passion and I became really good, especially in the area that I was from. And then football, though, always hovered in the back of my my head of the thing that I, I loved the most, but I was always hurt. So yeah. like I, I was, I, I don't think I, shoot, I think I was hurt almost every year. I even got hurt actually at the end of my senior year because my junior, a sophomore year, I missed half of my sophomore year. My junior year, I think I only played two games. So in high school, I probably only played like 13 total games. Okay. Um, but that's because I was hurt all the time. So then my freshman year, I started as a freshman, got hurt my freshman year and um, separated my shoulder. Um, mm. I, I, became, I, well, I, I got the starting role, played five weeks, then got hurt, missed the rest of the year. And um, it's hard to have a good career if you're always hurt. Um, it's not yeah. nearly possible. I was going to say, yeah. so that, that when, you, when you are always hurt, you, you know, a lot of players have been uh, just been hurt now. The Steelers, Alfonso Graham, right? He went to running back injury. Corey Trice just went through an injury. Yeah. How do players adjust to that? That's, uh, I don't know, how, how do you try and figure that one out as a player who is hurt, but you've got to make a living as a player as yeah. well? Uh, that, that's where I was going next, you know. Um, <clears throat> Injuries are a mystery. There is no way to define them. There's no way to um, prevent them. Um, there's no way to um, um, to predict them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Walter Payton and I had a great conversation one time um, about injuries. And we basically came to that conclusion that I just that I just drew for you right there. Okay, you, you can't predict them, you, you can't anticipate them, uh, you can't avoid them. But what's the things that you do control that can help you maybe mitigate them? And and there's really two things. 
be in excellent shape. I mean, when you when you get ready to come in a training camp and get ready to play, just be in superior condition and then play 100 miles an hour all the right. time. And and now and actually that, you know, you look at his career. Um, I think he missed one game in his entire career or maybe didn't miss a game like but somewhere in that neighborhood. And I think, you know, Peyton played like 12 years, all time leading rusher in the National Football League when he left. Now, after my freshman year, um, I don't miss another game. I don't miss another down. I don't even miss pra- I missed practice one time in 13 years um, because of a bee sting that I got really? on my day off. When I was going yeah. back to camp during training camp. My foot had swelled up so bad I couldn't get my shoe on. That's the reason, that's the reason I couldn't play or I couldn't practice when I got back into training camp. Yeah. So, I don't know if um, you like like coming here then because in Australia we got some big bees and some big wasps here too, man. Some big spiders as well. Yeah, I don't know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the deal: I don't have to practice there. <laughs> I just wear my flip flops if I get stung there. <laughs> That's true. You know what's one funny thing? Because we have a running joke here. You guys call them over there flip flops. Did you know we call them thongs here? Uh, was um, it in- well, yeah, they, the the one pair of shoes they'll call them thongs here. Now that everybody calls them sliders. Ah, uh, yeah, the, the new, they're like the new kicks, aren't they? Slide, new kicks, right, them, yeah. they? Yeah, there's no, there's no um, thong thing between the toe, and your big yeah. toe and your next toe. Yeah, I, I, I can never wear those. Those irritate me. They, they, yeah, they I'm not, not, my not toes. Not I either. Either. I've never been able to wear those shoes ever. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I, I, I want to try and um, I want before we get into find a way because I'm really curious about your philosophy. Now, I have been trying to be use your find a way philosophy. Your three words. Uh, the last two or three months, I've been a little bit, well, the audience has noticed, but I've been in a little bit of funk. I think we all go, th- go through funks here and there and stuff. Before we jump into that stuff, though, I do want to ask you one real big question. What's it like running over a, like a, a Cincinnati Bengal when you're running the football? What's it like to actually hold a football and run someone over? You know, like, cause I, I haven't played football. I play pickleball and I'm not a uh, physical guy, but what does it feel like when you're running through someone? Well, I would probably like, okay, so do, do you play golf? Uh, I've I've played golf. I never actually played it. Like never, never like. So, well, you know. well, in pickleball, in puck pickleball, there's probably this technique that you use, and when you've hit something just right, you feel it. Oh yes, you feel like the tennis pureness. Pureness. Yeah. Okay. So you you feel the pureness. There's there's an art to it. There's a technique to it, and when performed correctly, you feel it. And right. that's like when, when you hit a good golf ball and you hit a good golf shot. You're like, oh my gosh, that feeling is so much different than that shank I just had. Yeah. I felt, well, th- there's no different in that, you know, as a runner, your job, I always, you know, I've coached for a long time too. Um, every age, eight to 18 and the professional ranks. Um, and, but it's the youth football area that is the, um, the area that <clears throat> is most misunderstood. See a running back, um, we are not, we're not supposed to, we're not, you're not allowed to hit us. And that is the problem with this. some running backs have this mindset. Well, they're, they, they hit us. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You hit them. Okay. okay yeah. They don't hit you. I know they're trying to hit you. Yeah. Don't let them, you hit them back. If yeah. you hit them back, you'll be a lot better runner than if you think, oh, I'm just here. They're here to tackle me. You know, they're here to hit me. No, 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 no. I know that's their job to tackle you, but you strike back. And a runner that will strike back, and a, a runner that learns to strike back, you'll be, you'll just be a better runner. You'll break a lot of tackles. I go, listen, mm-hmm. that's their job to hit you. Don't let them hit you. Don't give them a bunch of, don't give them a bunch of targets to hit. I go, this is why we we put shoulder pads on. Okay, these are our weapons. This is what we 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 put on to protect us and to use. Okay, and use the proper techniques. Uh, I, um, Chuck Knoll is really like the. Now, he's a founding father of a lot of fundamentals. You know, we got a, a thing here called heads up football. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really all Chuck Knoll's principles about being a better, safer football player. Um, it's same foot, same shoulder, rising blow, first contact wins. Now, if I walk through all of those techniques and explained all, all them to them, and then you mastered them, um, and then applied them, you would feel the difference. You would feel like yeah. same foot, same shoulder as, you know, having like football is, is not played up here. Football is played down here and it's played in a coiled position. You know, if I had to give you, if you had to 
if there was two lines, if there was a speed line and an agility line, and you had to pick one line that you got in and you got that skill, you would always pick the agility. I would always pick the agility. So no matter what the position, football is more start, stop, explode, recover, restart. You know, football is not just speed. Okay, that's mm-hmm. track. You want real speed, then you 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 go run track. To get to your real speed, some form of agility will apply. Uh, I was talking when I was just at training camp. Um, you know, we were it wasn't really a debate. They they were interested in my. There's a th- here's the three things to be successful in the National Football League. One, your IQ. You, you got to mm-hmm. be a smart football player because the intellect in the National Football League is superior to any level of football you will ever experience. College, college is is first grade math. The National Football League is a doctorate program, period, end of story. That's the difference between the IQ. So if you don't have that, whatever athletic ability you have, if you don't have it, it's going to be minimized to half. If you have a really high IQ, then all of your athletic ability will be able to be maximized at the next level. So then to go to athletic ability um, or a football skill set, your ability to be laterally and vertically explosive and dynamic in a short space most important in every position you can throw any position at me and i could explain why that's important you know, people will go okay quarterback okay well before quarterback could even throw the football his footwork his meticulous footwork from yep. under center or from the shotgun has to be precise and accurate for the success of this to even come into play in fact almost all of good and bad throws are a function of footwork. Mm. Um, A wide receiver may be fast, but initially every start of a route has some element of start, stop, redirect, and some explosive dynamics in a small box. It's just like offensive lineman, defense line, same thing. Linebackers, running back, same thing. We, we, We could talk about all the positions. Nobody just lines up, looks over at the starter, and then takes off and runs without ever having to do some sort of stop, stop, redirect. So now if you have both of them, no, that's then you, you have a chance to be extremely special. But that ability to start and stop, being vertically and laterally dynamic is vital. So it goes IQ, vertically dynamic, agility-wise, and then speed. And everybody always uh-huh. harps speed, and the speed is really like third on the list. You know, like if, if it was about speed, here's what we do. We go to the Olympic trials. Go to Australia. Whoever doesn't make your Olympic uh, 100, 200-yard sprints, we sign them. But that that doesn't make a football player. Speed, just, it's, one, it's just one of the elements. So, And it's often overrated and overlooked as it's the most important. Greatest receiver in NFL history, run a 4-6, Jerry Rice. Mm-hmm. Greatest running back or all-time. I'm not the – I mean, one of the greatest running backs. The all-time leading rusher, though, Emmett Smith, 4-6. Those aren't good. Those, those are like those. Those are considered um, um, below average speeds for those positions, and they're the two best. Why? Because Jerry Rice was incredibly dynamic in and out of breaks, running routes, his work ethic. Okay, all mm-hmm. those things are what what more molded him into the greatest wide receiver ever. Emmett Smith, his agility, his ability to start, stop, his balance. You know, all of those things preceded his speed. That made him such a great runner. It's it's interesting you say about Australia because we did try sending sending over. There was two Australians that, that, that went over. One of them actually is in big trouble now, so I won't say his name, but he's in a lot of trouble to do with um, certain things I don't want to get into too much. But he played for the 49ers. And another guy went over there. His name was um, uh, Holmes, and he played for the, the Jets. There was one thing I did find there, and even just talking to you now, saying, hey, you need to get, get lower, right? The Australians, they ran the same way we, we play rugby league, but they, they run – high high and, and like a normal uh you know a normal back like that but they didn't get the concept of like what you just told me then is is, is to get lower and then low pad wins right so we do have a few australian punters over there but i don't see oh there's a few other guys that play offensive linemen uh jordan jordan Mylata for um the eagles he he's done quite yeah. su- successful for him he's done really well but i think yeah. he's a bit different because he's actually put time and effort and energy into the game and really chased his dream to put that passion, you know, in, put, put all his all into it. The one bloke I referred to, Holmes, he pretty much went over there for a preseason, played with the Jets, quite a few games, but then he came back. 
Um, but I do want to try and transition into into find a way because all these kind of stuff you're talking about with the passion behind the game, the running. What 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 is what is find a way like just in the, in a, in a big nutshell, and then I'll, I want to try and explore it a little bit. Well, the words find a way have helped me live a dream and fight to live and a lot of in between. Um, but the real journey and where it all started was as a kid. Um, um, I used to hear a lot about um, write your goals down. I hear teachers go write your goals down, pin them up in your bedroom. It's where you start and end your day. And um, you know, this happens around 1970. 377 so you probably weren't even born around then but um and i'm i'm not sure that um well australia is probably very similar to the united states um not everybody had televisions back then okay mm -hmm. uh, but if you did it was a box about you know yay big a tan and there's an, an antenna and there's two knobs three channels no remotes even existed back then so you didn't have a lot of access to see things like we have today. I and mean, there's things like this didn't exist. You didn't do a podcast. It's crazy. You it's crazy. Nope. So, you know, you didn't have the resources that we have today. And you have to paint that picture because people are using the experience that they have today, you know, for people that can't remember 1973 or 77. And they're like, well, what do you mean you didn't have TV? I mean, now you walk in, you have TVs everywhere. So you just didn't have a lot of resources. You didn't see things. Um, as constantly and as much as you see them day and the access to so many different things and exposed to so many different things. So things like, you know, writing your goals down, uh, pinning them up where you start and end your day. Um, I heard that a lot. Um, and I was asked as a young kid, uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? And I remember thinking, God, I don't have no idea, you know. Um, but I go back to the television part because um, so we we had a television, but one of our rules on Sunday was we couldn't have the television on. Uh, my dad wanted to, you know, nothing on on Sundays, and it's more of a, a holy day and a, a spiritual day. And so the first time I ever saw television was when I went to my grandparents' house because they always had their television on on Sunday. And it was one Sunday that I went there, and their TV was in the kitchen. I walked in, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I never seen football on television." It was the Green Bay Packers were playing. And I'm like, a bunch of things clicked for me on that day. I'm like, I know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I want to play in the National Football League. I've been doing that in the backyard. I got, I had no idea they're doing it on television. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what I want to do. I got so excited about that. Um, and then I started thinking like, oh gosh, that write your goals down. Pin them up where you start and end your day. Great idea, but I have a problem. I got a little brother and I got a bunk bed. Um, so I actually did write the goal out I, and the goal said I would play in the national football league. I pinned it up on my wall and my little brother tore it down. Um, so I would pray diligently every night that, um, he and that bunk bed would disappear. Um, and it doesn't mean I didn't love my little brother. I just, I'd lay in bed at night, actually, um, fall to sleep thinking about the one thing. If I had my own bedroom that I would love to have mm -hmm. that I'd never seen in a bedroom. And that's a wall of cork. And the wall of cork was to pin goals up. Well, we had a, uh, uh, where we lived in Pocatello, Idaho, during the winter time, our basement, our concrete basement was our playground. And my dad announced one night at dinner that um, we're going to lose our playground during the winter time. But one of the advantages was I was going to get my own bedroom. Well, as soon as he asked that, I was like, can you make me a wall of cork? He asked why I explained, he said, I'll see what we can do. Um, so I have some time on my hands. So I write down all my goals. I still have junior high, high school, college to attend. So I thought, you know what? If I can make every a goal in junior high, high school, college, and every one of those helps me get to my ultimate goal, I'm mm -hmm. going to play the National Football League. I'm like, that would be cool to be able to put that on my wall. That's why I wanted a wall of cork because I didn't want just a cork board. I mean, I was going to put goals all over the place. So it was really that what I call a moment of truth in life or a moment of self-reflection where my room gets done. Um, I walk in, there's my bed bumped up against a wood chair rail and there's three panels of cork above it. It's not an entire wall, but man, it's half a wall. It's big enough. So I jumped up there. I pinned all my goals up and that moment of truth, um, which we, we've all had where 
you got to make a choice. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sitting there looking at that goal out playing the National Football League. But I think I start thinking about all the things people used to say to me right after they asked. Hey, Merrill, what do you want to do when you grow up? I go, I'm going to play in the National Football League. Oh, man, you know how hard that is? Do you know what the odds of you playing in the NFL are? Oh, son, don't put all your eggs in one basket. We wouldn't want you to be disappointed one day. Or it was impossible. Well, I start thinking about all those things. Um, and I go back to that moment of time. That's why I call it a moment of truth. And the more I thought about them, the more I, the more I will play in the National Football League it was nothing more than words on a wall because – those thoughts consumed my thought process. And I call it a moment of, of, of truth, but also a moment of self-reflection because I had really opened myself up to that goal. Mm -hmm. um, I'd made a commitment that like, I want to do that. I mean, that's what I really want to do. And in that process, like these words find a way pop into my head. And they did for me on that day, what they still do for me today they inspire action. They change my thought process. They, they force ownership in my life in that I'm in charge of that. I'm in charge of that goal. I'm responsible for that goal. I am the one that's going after that goal. Everything else that's been said to me, mm -hmm. if I'm going to let that consume my thought process, then I'm not going to accomplish that goal. But if I do something about that goal and I find out ways to go after that goal, well, guess what? One of two things I've learned will happen. You'll either accomplish that goal or you'll learn something on the journey you would never have learned that will be valuable in your life had you not went on the journey. So either way you win. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it changed my whole perspective of that goal. It washed out all of those negativities. Um, it gave me a sense of energy. Um, it inspired, it, it's, it inspired and sparked me to take action, which is mm -hmm. a responsibility we all have. I don't care what your circumstance is, your deadline mm -hmm. is, whatever you may be facing, you have a responsibility to do something, to sit around and do nothing. Well, don't be shocked by the outcome if that's what you choose to do, but to do something about your circumstance is a responsibility we all have. And I felt that in that ownership aspect and that self-reflection moment. And I end up taking my goal. I will play in the national football league down a card. And at the top, I end up, I have extra, I had extra like 13 by 16 cards. And I wrote the words find a way there. And I stuck those up there. And those words still today are really a principle in my life. Um, every, I got my goal board over there and, um, I still write my goals down. I still have visuals because one of the most powerful thing to help any human being in a progressive manner, um, in a positive energy, no matter what your goal, deadline or circumstance is, visuals are vital. Visuals are critical at helping one achieve things. They also can be mm -hmm. extremely negative. You know, it's mm -hmm. going to be a choice in what you want to feed your mind with. Um, you're in charge of that. Nobody else is. Um, if you say, well, everybody kept telling me, well, you let it in then. Mm -hmm. You let it in. You're responsible for that. You're responsible for shutting that out. You're responsible for changing your mindset. You're responsible for finding different ways to do things if that's not working. That's why you self-reflect and check on yourself. Okay. That's your responsibility. That's our responsibility. That's when, when I talk about ownership. When you take ownership, um, you do a couple things that are powerful. You end cycles and break chains and you create new ones that favor you. Um, and that's really what where Find A Way started for me. Um, but they've helped me when I was diagnosed with cancer. They've helped me um, uh, in career ending head trauma where I laid in intensive care for days. Um, I had to learn how to read again, um, went through major depression um, in that state, in those dark state. It was that moment of the truth where I was like, I have ownership in this. I got to get my butt off the couch and do something to help myself. Yes, there was a lot of people offering help. I, I, I reached out to that help. I accepted that help. That helped the process. And it isn't that I just took ownership, got off the couch, and then everything worked out all right. It still was an arduous journey of five years. But if I don't take that ownership and that responsibility on that day, on that couch, it's probably not good. 
Um, and it still comes back to ownership and everything that you do in your life. Um, mm -hmm. You can point fingers, cast blame and make excuses all you want. And you will sit in a blender of misery and disaster. Um, and I've never seen anybody garner success out of that. And I know that because I've been in that blender. Yep. I can't speak to it unless I've been there. Um, and I've been there. Um, so I know the difference of taking ownership and getting out of the blender. Um, I know that um, those words have, have been pillars and principles in my life that drive me. You know, they help me through cancer, open heart surgery. They help me live a dream. And I talk about a lot of in between. They've been pivotal in, in parenting. They've been pivotal in business that I've done. Um, like every aspect of my life, they they play a role. And I'm grateful for that guidance. That's why I like to share it because find a way isn't about, hey, this is how I found my way. So you do it. No, 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 no. You, you take ownership of where you are and what your tools are. And then you find your way and you have that ability. You, it starts right here. You know, everything mm -hmm. starts here. I don't, no matter what one might think, the second a thought is thrown out there, this forms an opinion. This yep. starts yep. the direction. And the more you, as I tell people all the time, the key to all of this, do you control your mind or does your mind control you? Mm -hmm. So the more tools you put into place when somebody, you know, feeds me negative information, I block that. You know, I know how to I know how I know how to handle it, divert it, what channel to put it in and exit it. Not not let my my mind or body feed on it. Um, I'm in charge of the, what I want to be programmed into here, what I constantly feed myself, what I constantly look at and visualize. Those are the things that you become. Those are the things that you will accomplish. And that is all about habits and patterns that you get to put together, okay? Not that I'm gonna tell you to put together, that you get to put together, but you have to take ownership of that and realize you're in charge of that. Once you do, powerful things happen. I, I think with all that with all that being said is why well, I think those words to find a way makes you question all of that stuff. Cause I have been in a little bit of a funk recently with certain things going on, won't go into too many personal details, but a little bit of a funk here and there. I think most uh, humans and, and, and men can, and men don't really like to express their you know, feelings like that. What I have found in that, in that find a way, even just saying that certain, that certain three, uh, word phrase, you know, the first word find, you're looking for something to, to, to like, you know, like to, to find or accomplish something. And then, you know, like what, is, what do you have to do? And then you got to figure out what it is. And then when you say that, when I'm like, okay, cause I do Uber on the side to make a bit of coin while I'm doing my part-time, um, YouTube here. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to drive today. But then like, well, how else am I going to be a successful YouTuber and continue this brand to keep building? Well, I've got to find a way. And then when you tell yourself that, you jump out of bed. But I see exactly what you say. I'm not comparing anything to, to your stories like that, but just comparing like the, the, the message to find a way. If you lay down long enough, you're going to sit in that misery, aren't you? And I've been, I've been there like just in self-pity for no reason. But then you start putting those positive uh, voices in front of you and the next minute you're out there driving, you're out there doing something. I, I think it's a really cool way. It's a really cool thing. Like to be very, to be very honest, I think well, it's Mark, awesome. Mark, I'm gonna just tell you this. You just you just said what it's about. Honestly, it's, just, it's about you. It's a you couldn't have you couldn't have better said it any better. You know, to lay around and do nothing. Well, don't be shocked at the results. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that that energy. So something has to. And listen, I understand they're just words. At the end of the day, everything's just words. If they don't stimulate some sense of action and get you to do something, well, they're just words. Mm -hmm. But if that if something will hit a fuse, will spark you to do something, to get up off that couch, to you know what, go, yeah, you know what? You're right. If I don't go do that today, I'm not going to be able to do the other thing that I love so much. Mm -hmm. And I will promise you this. I this is a 100% fact. There's not a lot of 100% facts you can get in life. I can promise one of two things is going to happen if a person continues to try and do something every day about their circumstance. Whatever that circumstance is, if they do something, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to stumble and come across something they never ever dreamed would happen to them mm -hmm. or they're going to accomplish what they're going after. One of those two things is going to happen. But if you do nothing, don't be shocked by those results. Um, you know, I, I, there was a uh, an experience that I had as a as a uh, as a player my rookie year by Chuck Noll, 
Um, you talk about another principle in my life. This would be a principle. Um, it's uh, opening day, opening week. We're going to play the San Francisco 49ers. I'm about to live my dream. I'm going to play my first NFL game, and we're going to play the San Francisco 49ers. They have just won the Super Bowl. They're supposed to win it again. Jerry Rice and Joe Montana are coming to town. One thing I can tell you about the National Football League that existed then and still exists today, if you make a mental error on your dress rehearsal practice, which would be Friday before your Sunday game, I have seen players get cut, escorted off the field, and disappear in a white van, and I never saw them again. By making mental errors, not being prepared, walk in there and make a mistake. Because coaches can't trust players like that. You can't win with players like that. So what they do, they get rid of them. Well, I step in a huddle, and I've known that. I knew that. So only being a mini camp and training camp for, you know, two, three months, combination of it all. I knew that all. I already knew that. You step in that huddle, you better know what you're doing. So one of my very first times I step in the huddle on a Friday practice, we call a pass play. Our quarterback, Bubby Brisk, calls a pass play. And I know what my responsibility is right away. I'm already walking in my head. I have to block a linebacker if he comes. I hope he doesn't come because then I want to run a route and I want Bubby to throw me the football. Well, he gets under center, snaps the ball. My linebacker drops. I run a flat route. He throws a ball, ball at the other side of the field. John Stallworth catches it. John Stallworth catches it and he starts to run. As he's running, whistle blows. The only coach in NFL history to win four Super Bowls in five years, Chuck Knoll, asks me what I'm doing. This is exactly how it starts just before somebody gets escorted off the field and disappears in the white van. That's how it starts. Mm -hmm. When he asked me what I was doing, my first thought was like, oh, my gosh, that linebacker may have blitzed. If he was standing by the quarterback, I'm going to the van and I'm disappearing. I'm telling you, I'm done. You don't make that mistake. So I located him and he was in coverage. I hadn't, I hadn't messed that up. I had run the right route, but the ball was on the other side of the field. So when he asked me what I was doing, I said nothing because I was just standing there. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, I didn't keep you on this team to be a common football player. He said, I can bring anybody back. We just cut, do what you just did. So I'm going to do you one better. When we walk out, of the game uh, for the game on Sunday, I'm going to let you pick at somebody out of the stands and they're going to do what you just did. I didn't keep you on this team to be a common football player. Anybody can wow. do that. Be uncommon. Go help your buddy. Don't just stand there. How do you know he doesn't get hit, fumble? You could recover the ball for us. You can't do mm -hmm. that by doing nothing. Better yet, he breaks a tackle. You make a key block for us. We score a touchdown. You can't do that by doing nothing. He said, do you know what? Then he stopped and looked at the whole team. He goes, what the difference is between the team coming in here and us? They are more uncommon than we are. They are willing to do the little things and the extra things we are not. If you want to be a champion, if you want to beat them, be uncommon. Be uncommon in your everyday life. Well, I'm back. now listen, I'm going to rewind to the huddle. If you ask me, are you doing everything you can as a professional for your team and for your for your craft, your profession, and your team, are you? I would have told you, yes, I was prepared and I played hard. What more was there? On that day, he widened my scope to more I could and should be doing for my team and my craft. Mm -hmm. That changed my career. From then on, I had an uncommon approach. I looked at, and this goes to life in every aspect of life, you're either going to look at the minimum that you're going to do. Do not be, do, then don't be disappointed when you get minimum results. Mm -hmm. Willing to widen your scope and look at more things you can be doing, should be doing, and be uncommon in your craft, uncommon in your views. You will get more out of your life and you'll get more out of your career. You'll see all the other th the things that you could and should be doing. And you start applying them to your life. And that right there will end up being your difference. That will separate you from your opponent. That will give you the edge that you need. San Francisco 49ers went 15 and one that year. They lost one game. And do you know who it was? To the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. You guys? <laughs> I guess. To the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
But it changed, you know, that uncommon, I, I've never forgot that. You know, that challenge alone took me from being on the Steelers to being a starter for nearly a de decade in the National Football League because I looked at that every day I came to my locker. I was like, okay, let's let's be uncommon today. What more is there I can be doing and should be doing? And now it comes back to self-reflection. You know, it works mm -hmm. with find a way because we all have a responsibility to check in on ourselves. Ask questions like, are you doing your part? Are you getting everything out of your God-given ability? Are you giving maximum effort in the stuff that you're doing and striving for? Okay. Now, why that's why you're the judge and the jury mm -hmm. is you can't lie to yourself. Because when you're lying to yourself, you already know you're lying to yourself. Yeah, I was going to say you already know that, right? You yeah. know the truth. Mm. You know, so stand in front of a mirror and ask yourself, am I doing my part in life? Am I getting everything out of my God-given ability? Now, the great luxury of doing that is whatever the answer is. If the answer is, you know, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting everything out. There is more I can do it. Well, that's the great way of why we check on ourselves. Change it. Make a commitment. Make a new plan. Change that. Close yourself back up and take action. Go get everything out of your God-given ability. I think one of the greatest gifts any human being can ever give themselves is in a moment of self-reflection at the end of a deadline, the end of a journey, the end of a goal, the end of a dream. You stand in front of the mirror and you ask yourself, did you do your part? And your answer is yes. You can't ask for anything more. And I don't care where you end up. You might be the greatest of all time. You're excellent. Mm -hmm. You may have not, you may have not gotten to be the greatest of all time, but you got everything out of your God-given ability. You are excellent. Have peace with that. But the ability to say you did your part in life. I mean, there's nothing more or greater you can ask of yourself. I tell people all the time, nobody's going to hand you an award for doing working on the, the personal dirty things in your life. Nobody is. But you can be rewarded. You can be rewarded with peace joy, happiness, and personal success. And that inner, inner peace is better than any trophy you might have on your mantle one day to be able to give that to yourself. Man, that's unreal. I know you're really short pressed for time. I just want to um, ask you two more questions. And I really wanted to um, get your uh, insight. If, if it's okay with you, if we could um, talk about Tunch Ilkin for a moment. Is that, is that okay if we bring up the legend Tunch? Uh, for me, with my... I'd never look. I'd never watched you guys playing. I was born in 1989, so when I became a fan, in, uh, Steelers fan, in 2004, uh, was the Mad the Maddox era. 2002 was I played on the Madden games, all that kind of stuff. That's why I became a fan of the Steelers because of the colors. I've only really, you know, the last from 2008, I learned all the history, and now I'm a super crazy fan. But one of the first blokes, one of the first guys I ever heard on the on the Steelers Nation radio was Tunch Ilkin. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on the legend that is Tunch Ilkin because he was a real big part of my life when I pressed the Steelers radio app button and, and I heard the breakdowns and I heard the calls and, and him and Wolf. I think him and Wolf was one of the most like um, excellent radio duos. I know he's a, a, a good player as well, but I'm just like strictly talking radio. Those two together were fantastic, like absolutely fantastic on the radio airwaves. And it, it made me feel like old school Steelers – you know, approach to, to the game and stuff like that. Um, can you expand any any thoughts or any any cool stories on, on Tunch, Tunch Ilkin? Well, first of all, um, Tunch was a dear friend, one of the greatest teammates you could have. And um, his tragic death was, and still is, like it's, it's hard to still put in, into play, into words. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit. You know, we played together. Um, mm -hmm. Most people won't know this. I know you won't know this. Tunch replaced me in the radio booth with Bill Hillgrove and Myron Cope. I was the first player in Steeler history to do that. Um, Mr. Rooney asked me to come come do it. Um, I only share it because, like, everybody thinks Tunch Ilkin was the first player in the booth. Tunch and I always laugh about it um, because um, ESPN had – there was a shift about week five. I'd been in the booth about a year and a half. And I was working at ESPN too. I was doing both. Mm -hmm. And they had a shift and they needed somebody to go full time in the NFL about week five. So I opted to do that and I left the broadcast booth. Now, prior to that, the reason nobody really remembers me being there because we had our roles to find. Bill Hillgrove was going to be the 
play-by-play guy who set up the play. Myron Cope was going to add color like he's always done. And here's what my role was. Merrill will speak when spoken to. What? They never spoke to me. I mean, I, they asked me quite so. Anyway, I say it as a joke, but it was it's the truth. It's exactly the role that I that I had there. I learned a lot from there. But my my point is, mo- most people don't even know that I was I was ever in the broadcast booth. And the only evidence that I have is a that I did it, and then b when you look at the history of broadcast um, that's at Heinz Field or Acushire Stadium now, mm-hmm. um, the broadcast history. There's a picture of me and Bill Hill, Grover, Myron Cope. Um, so that being said, when Tunch takes over, um, the first thing I, I, I told him to do was try to befriend Myron Cope. You know, the way it was set up, Myron Cope felt that I that I was I was a threat to Myron Cope, when in reality I was no he created the threat. I was no threat mm-hmm. to Myron Cope. I haven't told him I was no threat. I knew I was no threat. I was just there to learn. I had great respect for him and you know, he'd been doing it for several decades. So I, I, I get how hard the transition would be to, you know, to invite somebody into a booth that you have never had and add that to there. And they, and they didn't do the best job of making the transition a part of mm-hmm. it. But um, if there was one guy, and as much as I tried to do it with Myron, he just was not receptive to it. Um, and Tunch broke that barrier down with him. And, and that kind of speaks to how, what Tunch was. I mean, Tunch was just, I mean, he was a dear, dear friend. I mean, when I say a dear friend, he was, when he left, uh, I think he went to the Packers, if I remember right. I took him and his wife out to dinner and I spent with the video crew, I spent about a month putting together a highlight reel of him. And um, all the time he used to say it was one of the best gifts he ever got, the highlight reel that we put together for him. But it was the first one of the first times where I really had a close friend. You know, you lose you get people get cut all the time. And you know, mm-hmm. but most of the time you don't know the people very long before they get cut, you know. And, and it's it's a kind of a brutal business from that perspective because people are constantly coming and going. But to have played with a guy for a few years like that and had as much respect as I had for him, it was hard to see him go. Um, and he was a great student in the game. He was reverent, um, funny insightful um and just a genuinely good human being you know and an awesome football player he's the only guy i've ever seen stagger jerry um reggie white they just come punch you know i'm sure that you probably heard a little bit about you know he had talked about his you know punch touch was his nickname Mm -hmm. he had punch that look when you can when you can take reggie white and staggering give him a standing eight (laughs) <laughs> is that you when got, you're getting off the line you're like when you're yeah, off the line you're like back, this? You know, like punch, you know and he, his hands would strike so quick and he was so inside and he was so precise man jerry right i mean reggie white come up <laughs> i'm gonna tell you i'm good if reggie white was alive today he'd be able to tell you about it um tunch was a technician yeah a tech technician man um undersized but man, he didn't give up sacks, man, and that's all that I, matters. He was a football playing Jesse. I tell you what, because because even for me, like I'm a massive, huge fan of the Steelers. I'm massive, right? But I think he was one of the first people I think I've heard like on the Steelers radio airwaves. And then you go back as you learn more and more about the history and the fandom and stuff like that. You go back to that stuff, right? Um, you know, him, him back in the old days. But to me, what I got the sense of, and it really hit me hit hit me hard to hit a lot of. I think a lot of Steelers nation hard all over the shop. What the best thing I think about Tunch for me on the radio airwaves, it felt like he was a mate. It felt like he was actually, he was he, when you was talking to Wolfley uh, back and forth about football, you felt like you were, you were sitting in the same room with them. It felt like for me being all the way in Australia, I was like, holy dooly, man. I feel like he's a mate. Do you know what I mean? Was that the, that the sense that you guys had your relationship too, that you were just good mates and well, how I- he... Yeah, I, I think that's a combination of how him and Wolf are. You know, they're really good friends. You know, they're dear, dear mm-hmm. friends. They they played against next um next to each other. You know, Wolf was a teammate of mine too. Um yeah. for a year. And then Tunch was a I played with Tunch a little longer, but those two played together in the trenches, you know. So they've been working together for a long time. So that's not surprising that that, that didn't translate and come out 
you know, that they're just talking and you're part of the conversation. That is, and that's how they are too. Both of them are just good human beings and mm -hmm. um, they're not better than you um, because of what they do. They're, they they make you a part of everything they're a part of. And that's what makes them truly great people. Yeah, that's, that's why it was fantastic. I just it would remind, you know, when I hit the button and just, it would feel like I was in the locker room with them. You know what I'm saying? Um, I know you are very pressed for time. So I'm going to ask you one more fun question before we get out of here. By the way, it's been fantastic. Everything you said, every, every story, the way to find a way. Um, but I did ask this question to Ike Taylor the other day. And I think he's a scout as well, right? Taylor's on, on the team too, isn't he? I think. Yeah, I used to um, yeah, he's, work, he's, yeah, he's working the same, same, same area I am and helping with. <laughs> Next the time you see me, if, personnel. if you do remember this, because I did ask him in, a, in one of his, because he does a bit of YouTube stuff too. Now, this question is kind of weird and funny, but it's it's pretty much, would you rather fight um, James Debo Harrison after his 99-yard interception? He went all the way down there, so he's after that. Or would you rather fight two male kangaroos? You can only choose one option. You fight James Debo Harrison, he ran all the way down, he's gassed, and he's laying on the ground, or do you fight two male kangaroos? James Harrison and gassed. Oh, that's the answer I get. That's <laughs> I've seen kangaroos, man. They don't mess around. That they that they got a jab that man you can't see coming. And yep. they, they get they get perched up on that tail and yep. They got too much power. Too much power. Oh, and there's nothing that make you more that would then there's nothing that would embarrass a human being more than getting whipped by a kangaroo. Okay, you get well, gripped by James Harrison. Everybody's gonna go, "Oh, that's terrible." <laughs> that's, not embarrassing. that's not embarrassing. But getting whipped by a kangaroo, that's embarrassing. Like, yeah, I care if it is kangaroo. <laughs> I've watched them. I've seen a few of those footages where you get some that telling their little jab. No, thank you. You know they can because uh, they've got really big claws too. They sit in their tail. They kick with their legs as well. A lot of power in the legs. They're full of muscle. Those big red kangaroos, the male yeah. ones, they can actually rip your guts out. Like they have incredible claws. Um, Ike did said the same similar answer. He said he wouldn't even allow James Debo Harrison to get off the ground. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah, said he'd give him the, the, the people's you elbow. Just first. Go, you just go choke him out when he's down on the ground. <laughs> like the and we're done. <laughs> oh, man. Anyways, I, I, I'm going to end on that one there. That was a fun one. I, I, if you do get to see Ike again, just say that crazy Australian asked me about the kangaroo question. I'll see yeah. Ike again. I'll, we'll talk. Well, I'll, I'll talk it, to Ike. That's, because, that's like, great. Yeah. Um, James Debo Harrison is like, out of all the Steelers in Steelers law history, he's my favorite of all time. I just love the way that he played the game. I just love the way his intensity, that Ravens game where he had three uh, three sacks, a fumble, and they said, send him to the Pro Football Hall of Fame right now. Like he just, he was all over everything. Just his mindset, his just physicality. He was just so fun to watch. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, the, that answer, that, that question, sorry, I, the, no one's chosen the kangaroos yet. <laughs> Well, if, 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 if they do, if they do, um, shame on them. Yeah, you, you get your you get your, your your butt kicked. Anyway, Merrill, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thank you very much for, for coming on and saying hello to uh, Still on Nation Australia. I know you are a very busy man uh, doing all kinds of things uh, with the motiva motivational speaking and, and the, the scouting and the, and the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers stuff. You are all over the shop, but you have given me an insight to a, a few things. I'm actually going to go, when I release this video, go back and watch it and be like, yep, it does make sense. So I do appreciate your time, Meryl, for coming on. Is there any final words you want to say to the audience or how well, can someone find their way if they're, in, if they're in a bit of trouble right now or a bit of, bit of negative energy? Well, just a real quick thing. I said it before, but it's, my, it's probably the most important aspect in any goal, any challenge or deadline or circumstance. Um, or state that a person can be in is that taking ownership is the start of change. And when I say ownership is when you stop pointing fingers, casting blame and making excuses and that you realize the power you have, the mm -hmm. power this has, you start channeling it, right? You start using the tools that you have to dig yourself out or accomplish what you're going after. Amazing things happen, but it has to start there. If you never start there, then you're never going to change things. You're never going to accomplish things because you sit in that blender of making excuses and pointing yeah. fingers and casting blame. And I have never met anybody garner any success doing that ever, ever. And I've been in that blender before, so I know. It isn't like I heard about it. I've lived it. Um, that one. And then just thanks uh, for having me, Mark, and uh, to all Australia Steelers Nation fans. That's what I love about 
Steeler Nation. Somebody asked me, he goes, where do you live? I go, what? you know what? It really doesn't matter where I live because I feel mm-hmm. comfortable wherever I go because there's somebody from Steeler Nation where <laughs> any place I can go. So I'm going to find them. So I feel comfortable yeah. wherever I go. I look forward to seeing you guys in Australia personally one time. Yeah, there is uh, there's a lot of black and gold everywhere, man. I, I walk around the airports and whatnot, and I wear my Steelers stuff on purpose so I get into a conversation. And then I got to tell them, let me know when you want to stop because I can talk too much about Steelers. But thank you, Meryl, for coming on the show. It was fantastic having you. And as always, guys, here we go, Steelers. Here we go.